This week on CrossFeed. I'll be a monkey's father-in-law. Or Caiaphas' granddaughter. Or a Muslim's teacher. Or Mohammed's impersonator. Or a Rustboro counter-terrorist. Hello, everyone. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. Well, welcome, everyone. Happy to have you here. Did you have a good week, Jim? Um, yes, we did. Uh, we had the uh, Youth Encounter Team spoke book with us. Um, Last uh, Sunday, and they did a concert, not real well attended, but I didn't think it would be because everybody was out of town for uh, uh, the 4th. But um, then on the 4th of July, we had everybody over. Th- we had the team here at the house to swim and cook out and stuff. So we had about 30 people here. And before that, we had uh, our vacation Bible school, and that was a wonderful week up here for us. And so after they left last week, it was kind of a quiet week at the church because my secretary was uh, out of uh, out on vacation. So just kind of able to relax a little bit. It was good. Good. Those are the best kind. I've had a pretty... Uh, things have been, you know, not a lot going on this week, uh, but, well, especially with the fourth, but, um, you know, just a lot of things. We're, we're just, we've got so many things going on with trying to get our uh, um, transforming congregation stuff going, and it's just a a whole lot of stuff yep. um, to and do we're going to preparation. Be doing, uh, oh, yeah, well, our vision team and all kinds of stuff, so we're trying to get that all taken care of. And then next week, I am at Camp Pine Shore, so I will be there. Um, my theme for the junior high is going to be God loves me, why should I care? Awesome. <laughs> so, that stuff. So how about yourself? You you keeping busy out of trouble? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, you know, you mentioned being gone. I think that I'm gone the following week. So it looks like we're going to have a couple of weeks off again. It's been a, a, tough to match things up. But, yeah, I'm going to take a little vacation, yeah. take some time off. So. So, look, you hear that, folks? He's on vacation. <laughs> so... What days will you be out of your house, Dale? <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I say I'm on vacation, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gone. Oh. So I, most of our vacations, we don't really go very far. So Ah, okay. Okay, we are, uh, well, we'll be going on vacation in August, and we will be gone, but uh, some members of the church are going to house and dog sit for us while we're gone. So we'll they'll be bringing in an extra dog, so we'll have three dogs over here instead of just two. Mm. Yeah, see, so. when we're gone, we have uh, um, people that sort of check up on the house and, and you know and, and things like that, and um, so we've got it, people sort of just watching the house for us um, pretty regularly. So that's kind of nice. And, you know, and, and otherwise we've got, you know, a yard full of deer and, um, uh, we found a mole today and, uh, you know, the usual squirrels and chipmunks and skunks and woodchucks and, yeah. <laughs> Small thing. Any monkeys? Yeah. No, no monkeys. No monkeys? No. Ever do a no. monkey wedding? No. I have to, um, this is, I, no, now, I gotta really, tell you. You should start showing to start this out by showing the trailer to Plan- Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Here it is. You know, <laughs> I, I showed uh, the Lion King uh, clip from that in my sermon this morning. So talking about remember who you are, your son of the king. So I've been wanting to use that illustration since I saw the movie in the theater. And I was mm-hmm. so excited to finally be able to use it. So, but. Uh, so this is this says the article says that it's India's first monkey wedding, um, but actually there was one back in two thousand and eight. So that's mm. an error. 
Um, and uh, so that's the one that you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't do Hindu weddings, and I don't do non-human weddings. So I this was I, I saw this article and, and I decided to to do it. But what kind of person are you that wouldn't do a non? What kind of narrow-minded? <laughs> We'll we'll talk more about you and your terrorist activities here in a minute. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So have to have to be uh, uh, different sex, but same species <laughs> as me. Yeah, it's you know don't like people that are different for, or at least you know critters that aren't different <laughs> that aren't the same as me. <laughs> so, um. I, I was I was hesitant, you know, to do this story because I remember like years ago, um, very early in the show, I think it was before we were even doing video, um, that we did the the woman that married the cobra, and and we got taken to task for that one for sort of mocking it, and uh, at least this one they're both the same species, but um, you know, I thought, okay, so how do we do this one? And, and still be sort of respectful to people and their beliefs. Any monkey business is ill-advised. I don't know. People. Well, this is, this is cool because you see, um, they, they, they like to, they, they wanted, they did these invitations to marry the monkey, but they found out, according to the forest ranger, it's illegal to marry a monkey. <laughs> Anyone found in doing that or attending the monkey marriage ceremony will be arrested. Yep. So they elope. So the monkey. <laughs> Yeah, and the monkeys and their owners went into uh, to hiding. And on the day of the wedding, more than 200 guards poured in where they confronted hundreds of people from a nearby village who arri- arrived to see the rare... A monkey wedding's a rare spectacle. I guess it is. I don't, I don't know how you would do that. <laughs> When's the last time you saw a monkey wedding? I... Uh, <laughs> see? Well, it depends how you define monkey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I love this quote. I've come all the way just to watch God's marriage and not because they see the monkeys as the, um, as the avatars of, um, Hanuman, the mighty ape that aided Rama in his fight against evil. All right. So I've come all the way just to watch God's marriage. And now the police are telling me to go back and stay away from the temple. Um, said a 72 year old villager after arguing with the policeman, they told me the monkeys have been captured. They can't capture God. <laughs> like, that is correct. They can't capture God. They can, however, capture monkeys. <laughs> what does this tell you? Then came the news. The monkeys had been secretly married in a ceremony somewhere deep in the forest. And they began to celebrate. No more monkey business! No! How do monkeys celebrate a wedding? I don't know. Forestry <laughs> officials immediately set out to look for the pair and finally found the female monkey... Chinky tied to a tree. They couldn't resist congratulating her and pose for pictures. <laughs> Tough police force there. She was tied to a tree. <laughs> That's how they treat their and gods. The, and this guy who arranged the reading. Oh, he did that to our Nash, god too. <laughs> he um, um, nursed this one monkey back to health, Raju, and he, Raju, he, he considers his son, and so the forestry officials took the two monkeys and released them into the wild, and he says they're going to come back. I know my son, Raju, with his wife, Chinky. They will come back home. I will have a big reception for them. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah. With banana cream pie and banana... Uh, hey, tarts and... But keep in mind the, the description of Raju, the groom... He's known for eating, sleeping, and smoking cigarettes with his owner. <laughs> it's like most guys. You know? No beer. No beer. No beer. Right, right. He doesn't drink alcohol. Boy, that's a good idea. Um, um, I do a monkey <laughs> wedding. I need plenty of alcohol. <laughs> no, you know, interesting. When I found this other article, um, I was I was looking for a picture of a monkey wedding. You know. Um, for the for the opening and and that's where I found this other one um and uh the interesting thing about it, this is in the telegraph um in the UK and uh it says that um a million uh let's see 
Killing the animals is out of the question. Most people believe feeding the animals is propitious. Over the years, as has had a de- disastrous effect across the capital of New Delhi, where bands of marauding monkeys create chaos. Powerful policymakers and their equally influential assistants walk warily down passageways in north and south blocks that house, amongst others, the prime minister's office and the defense and home ministries for fear of being set upon by monkeys concealed in niches in the imposing colonial buildings. The offices of India's chief of army staff, who heads the world's third largest military force, too, are barricaded against monkeys. A former army chief, once talking of nuclear war, was forced to pause after monkeys began banging loudly on the roof above him, apologizing for the interruption over which the military had no control. (laughs) So, there you go. If you ever want to attack India, use monkeys. They can't fight back against them. Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Man, that that would make that movie a lot more interesting to watch than India. Just watch him get taken over by Caesar and company. That's that's <laughs> why. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we know now that Dale would not officiate a monkey wedding, and he's a you know monkey hater, and he's a monkey terrorist. So maybe he needs to sit down with the FBI and explain how you feel, what to do there as a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're always reluctant to do uh, stories on um, the Westboro Baptist Church because we don't want to give them any more publicity than, you know, because that's all they care about anyway is publicity. And uh, so I was I was, I was, was hesitant to do this story, and um, uh, no, I don't have it. Um, anyway, uh, the, the gist of it is that uh, the FBI asked uh, some representatives of the Westboro Baptist Church to come in uh, for some classes they were doing, right? But they didn't tell them specifically why they wanted them to come, all right? The classes were to teach FBI agents how to... um, Do you have the exact quote there? It was... Yes. um, Well, actually, they they understood one one side of it, Timothy Phelps, the church leader and the son of Fred Phelps, said the program was designed to teach agents how to stay measured when they are speaking with a witness or a subject with whom they have a strong visceral disagreement. Okay, yeah. So that's that's what they that's what the church was told that you know this is to teach them you know and and these Westboro Baptist people are very strong and we get heated and so how do you deal with this? How do you work this out? How do you do that? And by the way. And the church members didn't get paid for this. There was no money that exchanged hands or anything. No. So, so, but really what it came down to is, okay, we need to teach these guys how to deal with terrorists. And we can't really bring a terrorist into the classroom. So who can we use so that they can have some practical experience dealing with terrorists? Oh, oh let's right. bring some of the Westboros in. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, come to find out, they were part of a domestic terrorism curriculum. <laughs> so, I talk about hands-on experience. <laughs> so, I, I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, that they, you know, um, yeah, law enforcement who attended the session said it was focused on domestic terrorism. They were told the FBI invited Westboro members to the police, they to the class, so officers and agents could see extremists up close and understand what makes them tick. <laughs> we need some loonies in here. <laughs> so you you do, yeah, you. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I just. I just thought this was brilliant. And, you know, it was supposed to be, they're saying it was controversial, you know, because of the, um, the, the lawsuit, uh, over whether it's okay to protest soldier funerals and that. But, um, you know, when you start to look at why they brought him in, it's not like they were bringing him in as, as sort of guest speakers to, as, you know, sort of experts in the field or anything right. like that to learn from them. They yeah. were targets. The, the, yeah. Um, you know, uh, um, one guy says, uh, you know, um, you know, he found one FBI uh, official said, uh, 
We found the group distasteful, but thought police and FBI agents needed to learn to engage people they disagreed with and to find ways to build relationships with them. You know, um, and he, they also said, um, the FBI has invited other controversial figures to speak to trainees in the past, including former members of a white supremacist uh, KKK. Um, now, I mean, these people are out there, even though, um, we think they're a little bit Looney Tunes. Um, you know, you need to, the FBI's got to deal with Looney Tunes. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. You know, um, mm-hmm. so how do you deal with these people? Um, yeah, they, that's their job. They, they can't choose who to protect. They, um, they, they got to deal with these people. So how do you deal with a bunch of Looney Tunes? Bring them in and talk to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's so much yeah. better than like a role playing scenario, because then right. whoever is playing that at that role has to sort of guess how these people would would respond. And here you get, I mean, this is this is hands on experience. This is like driver's ed behind the wheel, you know. Right. But again, you know, I don't know if I, I that was kind of funny. But maybe maybe they should bring in an Islamic extremist. Maybe somebody from Iran. Maybe go. show them a Muhammad documentary to see what they think. This correct. No, me. actually, don't show them one. Just tell them about Just one. Just tell them about it. <laughs> Just right. tell them it exists. All right. So, um, so BBC Two, uh, the TV network in the UK, um, is planning an. A documentary series on the life of the founder of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, saying, um, and and Iran, their Minister of Cultural and Islamic Guidance, says that they are trying to ruin Muslim sanctity. Now, understand, all right. First of all, when the BBC put this together, they consulted imams of both Saudi. Or I'm um, not Saudi, Sunni, and um, and Shiite uh, backgrounds, right? To make sure that they weren't breaking any rules, they don't have. And um, um, it's being made by Crescent Films Production, directed by a British Pakistani filmmaker who has made other Islamic related films, and um, one person who works on it has done two Iranian projects. Uh, 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 and a TV documentary for Al Jazeera. Okay, so these people are not right. Yeah, it's it's in line with Islamic tradition. It does not depict any images of the face of Muhammad or feature dramatic reconstructions of Muhammad's life. Right. So it's you know this this isn't going to be the sort of Cecil B. DeMille, um, you know, Ten Commandments or the greatest story ever told or you know or something like that. Um, <laughs> that's for sure but um you know th- 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 this is just a documentary talking about the different places and events and stuff like that a sort of you know narrator voiceover sort of thing showing different places and and, and stuff like that um but uh the iranian culture minister he's furious and um and uh is um Oh, and the the series has not gone out. No one in Iran has actually seen any of it. You know, I mean, come on, let's get real. Let's not be a. You know, I, I mean, do these people just wake up? And I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, do these people just wake up offended? Mm, it's morning. I think I'm going to be offended. The sun's coming up. It's time for me to be offended. <laughs> the BBC's decision to make a documentary on the life of the Prophet Muhammad seems dubious. And if our suspicions are proved to be correct, we will certainly take serious action. Well, that's a threat, okay? <laughs> um, and then one way to show objections is to express condemnation of the West over their despicable actions. <laughs> so, one. TV station in the UK is doing a documentary. And so now they have condemned the West, an entire hemisphere. 
to don't want to overgeneralize or anything. <laughs> so the, you know the this got me thinking, and and I I don't know maybe this is offensive, but when when they have to keep on saying. Islam means peace. Islam means peace. Islam means peace. And they have to constantly remind us of that. At what point do you go, why do you have to keep telling us that? Because they're lying through their teeth. Because <laughs> Islam means submission. does not mean peace. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, you know... <laughs> So I just so I, I, so I I don't know what their serious action is going to be. The, you know they're, they they've bent over backwards to make this all you know not offensive or anything like that. You know, meanwhile, you just all you got to do is like turn on the History Channel, and you've got everything. It's just ripping apart the um you know Christianity and questioning every single event in the Bible. And um, you know, I just I just read a article today about um. Oh, uh, they found the city of Gath, where Goliath is from, and um, and they had let's see, they found pottery with names on it that are very similar to the name Goliath, um, same sort of formation and stuff like that. So, because Goliath is is not a, um, it's it's not a a, a Semitic name, um, but they found that 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 name is is. Um, in line that it's very likely there was somebody named Goliath um, in the Phil- it, it, it's, it's a Philistine name, put it that way. Um, they found uh, well, I the mean, Philistines it, weren't uh, Semitic anyway. They were um, right. um, from Phoenicia. Right. Yeah. So, but it you know what it, the point was that everything that they found corresponds with the biblical description of. Um, of what we know about about the Philistines and 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 uh, and but this thing called into question the existence of David um, and and Solomon and the um, the nation of of Israel at the time, even though, and this was a Reuters article I think, uh, or Associated Press I forget, but it called it questioned the existence of of that kingdom, even though they found. The wall of of Solomon's um uh, the the wall of uh, was it Jerusalem, um dating back to Solomon's era, which so showing that that kingdom did exist at the time, you know. So it's like even though we have the evidence there, even though every time they find a new piece of evidence, it points to the truth of the Bible, they're still rip into the stuff. And what do the Christians do? It's going fine. Go ahead. You know, we'll just. Stand on the truth, and you know, watch you guys make fools of yourselves. But you so know, so what's this have to do with the Iranians? I'm saying we're not attacking them. We're not threatening serious action. Oh, you know, for doing this stuff. I'm guessing also that if you go to a mosque, they probably don't do chancel drama. <laughs> probably not. But they might do chancel drama, Muslim chancel drama in the school. Mm. All right. Not too far from my place, uh, just across the lake in Toronto. Um, we have a school. And this is the only school in Toronto that does this. Um, but it allows Muslim students to conduct prayer sessions during class hours on school property. It's a, a school that, uh, Valley Park Middle School, which is 80 to 90 percent Muslims, uh, Muslim allows an imam to come in and conduct a 30-minute prayer session in the cafeteria for 400 students. Uh, Friday afternoon prayer is considered one of the most important of the religious week, according to Sunday Mass for Catholics. Right? They used to, because the mosque is right down the street, they used to have them walk down to the mosque that they could take time off of school to do that. Um but uh, the problem was a lot of the kids were sort of dragging their heels and <laughs> wouldn't actually get there. <laughs> they were just taking time off. So, oh, well, we'll bring an imam in, and, and that way they have to go. All right. So now when you you hear this, you know, as Americans, we immediately go, whoa, separation of church and state, you know. But, um, but this is Canada, and Canada does not have 
It's, Canada does not, nor has it ever had a constitutional recognition of separation of church and state. Well, yeah, neither do we, but um, not exactly, at least not the way that it's popularly uh, promoted. But the principle in Canada is supposed to be one of cooperation and accommodation. Um, and that the Ontario Human Rights Code, which mandates accommodation of religious practice on a case-by-case basis. Um, but, but here's the thing. They're not allowed to, they used to have the Lord's Prayer said in public schools. Um, and it was removed because it was a form of religious indoctrination and at the same time stigmatized and ridiculed those children who had to seek an opt-out clause to be excused from saying the Christian prayer. Right? So now imagine a school with 80 to 90 percent Muslims who are um, going to this uh, Friday uh, cafeteria 30 minute prayer session. Right. So you're the one of those 10 percent that's like Christian or, you know, non-practicing or whatever, not Muslim. OK, so you, I don't know, probably have a study hall or something like that during that time. And uh, you think you're going to be ostracized for that? And how is this any different from the Lord's Prayer thing? Well, I think this is a lot different because, um, um, you know, you're not, that they're not required to, you know, take part in this. I mean, uh, uh, um. But the other ones weren't either. They could get a, a, a little, uh, you know, excuse slip sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Well, they had to get an opt-out clause. Okay. Well, that's true. But, you know, having to take an opt-out clause and hand it to the teacher and say, I, I, you know, I get to opt out of saying the Lord's Prayer is one thing. To say all Muslim students go down to the cafeteria, you know, for, for, for the noon prayer, um, well, that's different because you're not required, you know, that I just stay in class. They're all leaving. No, I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. And this is something that needs to be done, uh, that, that, that is to be required. There's no requirement of Christ, any Christian religion that one says that it's the Lord's Prayer daily. There is a requirement that they, that this prayer be held at noon. You know, facing Mecca. Now, what I thought was important, uh, you know, that somebody said was, um, uh, you know, number one, there has to be evidence of, of missing. One guy who's a, a Hindu said uh, he was worried about inflammatory preaching against Hindus, but there's no evidence that such things occurred. So I think it's, you're right to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a teacher say there uh, at the uh, monitoring the prayer, make sure nothing's said that is, you know, could be taken as uh, inflammatory towards another religion, uh, another race. Or to the government or anything else. Um, and the other thing is um, that they then do this on equally open to other groups. Uh, and so, um, you know, if um, that's fine, if they're accommodating religious beliefs of these students, then um, Christian students should have the same of the same rights. I mean, they should be able to have a Bible study after church, after school, or something like that, because. You know, okay. it's fair is fair. Which points out uh, in many schools across the country, Christian students have been wrongly denied the ability to hold Bible studies over lunch or recess. And most recently, parents seeking to exempt their children from classes inconsistent with the faith have been challenged. So there's your inconsistency. Uh, it's okay for the Muslims, but not for the Christians. And And with the Christians, they just want to do it over lunch or recess. Right. On the other hand, this is one school making their decision in one area. It is not a national practice. So who knows? Maybe this particular school would, you know, say, well, if we had, you know, a school that was 90 percent evangelical Christian and they wanted to hold a, a Bible study, then we would, you know, make that accommodation. So, so uh, you know, but but that, the, you know, this is a one Case by case school, so you can't make a, a a generalization on all schools across the country from from this one case. Fair enough. I this is the the reason that I always get nervous about um, school prayer. 
um, sort of institutionalized, organized school prayer. Um, because as soon as you say, um, yeah, you know, we're going to have all the kids pray, uh, then, well, okay, what if your kid's not in the majority? And, um, <clears throat> and this is an example of that I, you know, I, some of this may remain to be seen. I'm not sure how long this has been going on. Um, you know, is this going to stigmatize kids? There's no report of it so far. I imagine there's some of it is going to happen regardless of whether the kids are, you know, I mean, it's probably pretty obvious, uh, which kids are, uh, are Muslim and, and which ones aren't. It's like a, a guy that I know that, um, he was the new kid in school in Utah and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and one of his classmates asked him where he went to church. And he says, when I didn't give him a good, a good uh, Mormon answer, he punched me in the gut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think that's how they normally do evangelism. <laughs> don't do that. So, but, uh, you know, so, but I mean, you know, you're going to have a certain degree of, of, uh, and it's, it's not the fault of the religion as, as it is just uh, people's tendency to, um, to choose or t t to sort of be flag wavers, uh, for their cause and to stigmatize people that are outside of it, regardless of what that cause is or what their belief system is. Um, so I, I don't know. I, this just, it, it, it sort of reminds me of where the, um, school would get out early in places on Wednesday afternoons for the, um, so the kids could go to like CCD or confirmation or, you know, stuff like that. Um, in some places, I guess it's, it's similar to that. Um, and I, I guess if, if they have to do it at a certain time, that, 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 that time of the day is important instead of just having it as an after school activity. Um, that's understandable. I don't know. I people like you are the reason I was afraid to go to school as a just, child. It just makes me nervous because you know what's what is being sanctioned here. If and and I guess it, it really comes down to uh, if I mean I, I do think about this. All right, what about the atheist kids? All right, that aren't going to have no matter you know what you allow in there. They're not going to have anybody come in to do something with them. Okay. But they're stuck in school for an extra half hour in a study hall or something um, when they'd rather just go home. But since it's not at the end of the day, they're stuck with this, you know, wasting their time for a half hour. You can waste time with your friends when your chores are done. So, you know, there's still people kind of getting stomped on here. But, uh, you know, I guess... When you, when you get into areas of religious freedom, um, regardless whether you're talking about religious people or whether you're talking about, um, sort of even anti-religious people or, or even just non-religious people, um, that somebody's going to get their toes stepped on, um, pretty much whatever you do. So, but it's, I, it's not cut and dried one way or the other, um, and it's a tough thing. And, and, and most of all, I think it's always important to think about what about the minority? Regardless whether you're in a, you know, you're down south and, you know, um, in the Bible belt and you're one of the non-Christians there. Uh, or if you're at this school that's 80 to 90% Muslim and you're not one of the Muslims. Mm -hmm. While well, you're talking about Goliath and uh, finding inf information about Goliath, I figured they were going to look at the vowels GLT and say that's Galt, John Galt. Um, <laughs> uh, say a little, little throughout to our Ayn uh, Ryan Rand uh, thing we had a couple weeks ago. Anyway, um, 
They now many years ago they found the burial box called actually called a an ossuary of uh, the high priest uh, uh, Josephus Carthus, and the priest the high priest mentioned the Bible, and now they have confirmed the um, authenticity of his daughters Miriam, granddaughter, uh, granddaughter, granddaughter, yeah, Miriam, daughter of Yeshua, son uh, of. Caiaphas. You find it interesting that that uh, Caiaphas had a son named Jesus? <laughs> Joshua. Okay, but it's the same name. Oh, yeah. Well, this is a very popular name. Oh, I know. I know. It's a very common name. You know, it's a it's a it, it's a Old Testament biblical figure and, and it, um, you know, so it's like naming your kid Moses um, when you're Jewish. There's a lot of Moshe's around nowadays, yeah. but um, but it, it, yeah. So th- this was kind of interesting. Um, Which is more interesting because Caiaphas' first name is Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so okay. Hmm. So, but this is just you know, even if you question the um, the the Caiaphas ossuary. Which is found to be um, is considered authentic. Um, here's another one that points to that, and and it's just another example of. I mean, this is something that my um, my daughter asked me, uh, she, and um, she's uh, ten, and and she said, "Dad, how do we know that the stuff in the Bible wasn't just written by some guy? How do we know it's the word of God?" And and I was proud of her for asking that, and and I, I'm glad that you know that she's comfortable asking questions and 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 really thinking about this stuff. And um, and you said, "Shut up, kid." <laughs> <laughs> I got better things to do to answer those kind of questions. Yes. We don't allow those kind of questions. <laughs> no, and and so I you know I talked about uh, prophecy, and I said you know but. And, and and she she said, but how do we know that you know that that stuff? And and I talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls and and how we know that the um, for sure that the books of the Old Testament were you know that those things date back to before Jesus was born, and um, so we know that those things were written before he was born, and and so we see those prophecies, and we have proof that um, that those things that talk about his life were written before that. And I said, and, and also. Um, all of the different archaeology that's been done has all pointed to the Bible being true. And there hasn't been one single thing that's been found that has shown the Bible to not be true. Every once in a while, they find something they think. Um, like, for instance, there was... Uh, um, I, I didn't mention this to her because I was sorting laundry at the time. didn't have a, a um, lot to do or a lot of time. Um, but... Uh, you know, what, one example is the, um, uh, Jericho, right? We know where the city of Jericho was. Um, its ruins have been found. And, uh, according to archaeologists, uh, when Joshua came through, um, when you, when you date it, it was, uh, vacant at the time. And so, yeah, it would have been pretty easy to conquer. Well, they kept digging. And they found out, oh, no, we dated this wrong. As it turns out, yeah, there was lots of people there. Um, and, uh, yeah, it uh, pretty much fits with the biblical story. So, you know, it's every once in a while something comes along where they go, oh, well, yeah, what about this? You know, and, and you know, the, our response to that is, well, wait and see, you know, Um because really it comes down to interpretation of the evidence um, often or, or guesses about what this evidence means. And, but, but so far nothing, there's, there's not been a single conclusive thing that, that has shown um, that any of the, the events in the Bible didn't actually happen. So, right. Well, in Jericho, it was uh, Kathleen Kenyon did the original thing, uh, a digging. And then um, one of the, um, um, you know, and, and uh, but then they they looked at more like the um, 
the seeds and the amount of food that was there. It came that no, this thing did fall apart very quickly because if it was a long siege, there wouldn't be any food left. Um, so it was it was quite interesting to how some of that stuff happened. Um, uh, you know, in answer to your daughter's question, you know, scripture is self-authenticating. Um, we can prove that the Bible is historically accurate. We. And I've always tell them, you know, I'm real honest with the kids in, in confirmation. Other places, I said, you know, we we I can I can show you no problem that the Bible is historically accurate. I can show you it's more accurate, you know, unlike any other book that's out there, any other religious book out there. What I can't prove to you is that it is uh, the written word of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I can you know. I can prove to you six ways a Sunday that this, this, this stuff is historically accurate, that Jesus really, you know, some kid asked me, you know, how do we know Jesus existed? And I walked him through some of the evidences and go, but, 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 you know, how do we know for sure? I said, well, how do you know any historical figure existed? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how do you know, you know, do you know, talked about Caesar Augustus. How do you know Caesar Augustus existed? You know, I mean... You know, well, he, you know, I mean, that's just reality. Yeah, you, know, you have to take comments and things that were written down about this person historically by the people who were there. And you know, we assume that, you know, that person must have existed then. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, you know, in a hundred years from now, how's anybody going to be able to prove you ever existed? Right. You know, I mean, that's just what the way it comes down to. So, um, so we can prove Jesus existed. We cannot prove he was the Son of God. Right. So, <clears throat> but, you know, her question was, how do we know it's true? Right. And, well, you know, what, what, what do you mean by true? Well, yeah. Does true mean historically accurate, or does true mean the Word of God? Well, I knew what she meant. Because <laughs> when I answered her question... She went, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and she was yeah. good with it. And and actually uh, okay. applied it later on when something else came. Oh, this is like what you were talking about with the, you know, with this other stuff. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, um, uh, my, uh, to me is interesting was uh, it says that they do a lot of tests because that forgery is a real problem with these things. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls were questions about their authenticity. Uh, the guy who, uh, because the, 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 the Bend Benduins who found them, Bedouins who found them, originally sold them to a, a, a dealer, and uh, this guy was known to be a little bit shady. Um, and uh, the guy actually bought them, I he bought them for a dirt cheap price, and <coughs> sold them a few years later, sold some of the Dead Sea Scrolls later for the grand price of uh, $250,000. He advertised it in the Wall Street Journal. Yep, that's how they found out about it. Yeah, thought it might be a good gift for a seminary or a library or something somewhere. Had no idea what he had. <coughs> None at all. So, anyway, always kind of interesting. Hey, any comments, any thoughts, anything any Fiat body out there has, we're always interested in your opinions. You can always share them with us at crossfeed at podcast at, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. So, yeah, and I'm... Um, Nothing this week, just a reminder to, um, or you can, if you're watching this on YouTube or something like that, you can feel free to leave a comment um, uh, in the comment section on one of those sites. Um, and we'd like to encourage you, if you're uh, catching the podcast, to, uh, on iTunes in the podcast directory, to leave a uh, um, review there for us. Why? See, it's a nice show. You like us. <laughs> So that's it. So we're going to be taking a couple of weeks off, and uh, we'll see you again in August. That we will do. So God bless you all, and good night.